This is all about bringing the floor up, whether it's a run game, whether it's a pass game, whether it's our defensive scheme. It's all about bringing the floor up, and that's either your individual floor as a player, changing your best, bringing your floor up, or whether it's depth bringing that floor up. I think you're going to see that across the country in creating your own depth from top to bottom. That is something that P.J. Fleck said to the media after Minnesota's spring scrimmage yesterday on April 11th that really stuck out to me. Because he talks about building depth and more specifically raising your floor, yours and his players, throughout his talk to the media. In Minnesota last season, you saw inconsistencies just about everywhere, whether it was at quarterback or secondary or running back with Darius Taylor being injured or some of the incoming transfers with Corey Crooms Jr. and Sean Tyler from Western Michigan, for example, not quite being the incoming players or prospects, not necessarily to a fault of their own, that Minnesota needed. And I think that is a question that bears asking. Probably the biggest question for Minnesota entering this fall is can they build depth and do they have depth now? Minnesota hosted one of their many spring scrimmages and practices yesterday, again on April 11th, but this one was unique in the fact that this was technically their spring game. It wasn't an official spring game. It wasn't televised. I believe it was hosted indoors, correct me if I'm wrong, and it was the only one that was open to the public. Minnesota and P.J. Fleck had another spring scrimmage slash practice open, but you had to be a part of their NIL collective to see the practice for yourself. And me not being in Minnesota and certainly not being a part of their NIL collective, I have to save money for other endeavors, particularly earning my college degree, I didn't see anything, but I've read multiple articles. I'm going to link two of them from 24-7 Sports and also Fox 9 down in the video description. And also I will try and post them in this video as a informative tab that should be in the top right corner of the video of your screen right now. But looking at Minnesota and what I have heard out of spring practice, out of this scrimmage. It sounds like there are a lot of adjustments being made. They're really prioritizing depth, resting players who are injured or who are still worn out and recovering, but theoretically could play. And they're trying to get the transfers, incoming transfers involved. I think PJ Fleck is handling this his roster, his staff, nicely. Minnesota has already implemented um, headsets in helmets so that they don't have to use signals. That's something that's going to be a new part of college football that we'll have to get adjusted to, though I think we'll all adjust to it pretty well, is there's no longer going to be signs in college football. Rather, college football is taking a playbook or a play out of the NFL's book with communicating plays through walkie-talkies and and through headsets. So can Minnesota cultivate depth? Again, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, a few seconds ago, whatever, that's something they struggled with last year. Ethan Kaliak-Manis was the best they had at quarterback. And those below him, Cole Kramer and someone else, I think Drew Vieto, I think is how you pronounce his name, who transferred to Eastern Michigan, they were not nearly as good as Kaliak-Manis was, and Kaliak-Manis wasn't that good. In the running back room, you had Darius Taylor, and everyone else was far below him. At wide receiver, it was a pretty similar story with Daniel Jackson. And on the offensive line, it was a similar story with Ariante Erce and maybe Quinn Carroll. And then you had everyone else. And defensively, you had good players like Ja Joyner or Danny Strigo or Maverick Baranowski or Justin Wally or Tyler Newbin. And again... Not much depth beside those players. Entering this season with a schedule that is once again tough, like Minnesota's schedule last year. In fact, last year's schedule, I think, was a nice preview for how future schedules will be for former Big Ten West teams. Of course, tougher schedules than what Big Ten West teams are used to or 
were used to, it will be more important than ever for Minnesota to have depth. So when an injury happens, like hopefully, I'm praying this doesn't happen, but if Darius Taylor gets hurt, you can have someone rise up and replace him and do the job not exactly as well, because that's asking a lot, but almost as well as Darius Taylor just does his job, which is running the football, pass blocking, catching passes out of the backfield occasionally, but mostly running the football in between the tackles or blocking receivers, tight ends, or in between the interior of the offensive line. I want to focus in on the defensive and offensive side of the ball because there were some key takeaways from this scrimmage. And then I want to talk about my overall thoughts on Minnesota in light of what I've read about April 11th's scrimmage and other events that have happened in Minnesota spring practices. Minnesota's defense yesterday was the better side of the football. Ethan Robinson returned an interception for a touchdown, and the defensive line seems to have found their starting lineup, which isn't much of a surprise given that the defense returns nearly three-fourths of their production, and I think every starter on the defensive line. Danny Strigo, Anthony Smith, Jalen Logan Redding, Jod Joyner, and Devin Eastern, that is the starting defensive line rotation. This is per Fox9.com, who reported on this scrimmage. And it's similarly on the offensive line as well. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but good trench play is absolutely critical for success in the Big Ten, especially on the interior. In the Big Ten, it matters more that you have great defensive tackles than great pass rushers. It matters more that you have elite guard play, and this is for everyone because the center is who snaps the football and who commands the O-line, but good guard play, good center play, more so than good tackle play. This is more so for running the football. Of course, in passing the ball and pass defense, you want to have good pass rushers. But the Big Ten is a run-heavy conference. It is a slow, gridiron, mudfest conference. And in a conference where you're going to run the football more than other conferences, having good interior trench play, having corners, safeties, linebackers who can come up and play run defense and who can tackle well is so so critical. Absolutely critical. It's what's that's what has set Michigan's defense apart, not just under Jesse Minter and not under just under Mike McDonald, but even in some of the Don Brown years. Michigan's defense was big, physical, fast, slow down the run, and they could rush the passer as well. And Minnesota under Joe Rose under Joe Rossi has been impressive in that in 2021 and 2022. But he is gone. He's off to Michigan State, and Corey Hetherman is the new defensive coordinator at Minnesota. So there are some changes there, but he was promoted from within, from what I remember. And as expected, there aren't going to be many systematic or schematic changes in that regard defensively. But last year, there was some youth at secondary, and at linebacker, and now a lot of those players returned. Ethan Robinson, who again had that interception and returned it for six, and Giante McMillan are two incoming corners. Minnesota was very selective in their transfer portal class, bringing in only two defensive players, cornerbacks, and then wide receivers, running backs, and a quarterback, of course, in Max Brosmer, who Robinson picked off, returned for a touchdown, and the defense had several sacks, many quarterback hurries, passes defended. This is all encouraging, as even though Brosmer is still adjusting, of course, to playing a better defense than any defense he played at the FCS level, a more talented defense, bigger, physical, he also does get the benefit of having a better supporting cast, and I think he is better than Ethan Kaliakmanis, as I discussed in my broad spring game preview in the segment where I focused and touched on Minnesota. I think he's a better quarterback than Kaliak Manis. Kaliak Manis transferred to Rutgers more so because he knew he likely wasn't going to be starting at Minnesota this year, not because he necessarily had multiple options. The defense dominated. 
I think Minnesota's defense overall will improve. They should improve at least because of their growing experience and key portal additions in the secondary. They have right now in the front seven, they have four. I was about to say three, but they have four redshirt seniors, six players who are of junior age and experience or older. And the one exception to that is Maverick Baranowski, who's a redshirt sophomore. So you have all of the projected starters. This is per rlads.com. And I'm also including Jalen Logan Redding in, in this. So eight rotational players. All of them have at least three years under the belt of PJ Flex program. And none of them, none of them are incoming transfers. So they are bred, trained, and mentored and coached here at Minnesota for all three of those years in that same defensive system. I think you're going to see improvement there. Justin Wally returned, uh, Coleman Bryson, Jack Henderson, Darius Green, they returned, and Ethan Robinson and Giante McMillan are incoming senior transfers with a lot of experience at different schools. So I think the defense will bode well from that. It's good to see that they dominated in practice, which given Minnesota's history under Fleck, isn't too unusual. Recently, they've been much better on defense than on offense. Before we resume any further and talk about the offense, this is a nice time to remind you to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, and comment your thoughts on what you've read. Or if you're a Minnesota fan in Minnesota, maybe you went to that spring scrimmage yesterday on April 11th and you know something that I don't. In fact, if, if you've went there, you definitely know many things that I don't know, and you've seen things that I haven't seen. So tell me, if, especially if you went to that scrimmage, what you saw, what your reaction is, what your thoughts are down in the comments section below. And share this video around to as many Minnesota fans as you know. College Football with Sam is the best Big Ten football channel on YouTube. We produce the best Big Ten-related content on YouTube, and we're trying to reach out to as many Big Ten fan bases as we can, and also in other videos and other content, we're trying to branch out to the college football world as a whole. Thank you to my Patreon members for sponsoring this video and channel. If you want to go the extra mile and support this channel monetarily, you can subscribe to my Patreon or purchase merchandise on my merchandise store via the link in the description or the pinned comment. There will be shout-outs for my Patreon members at the end of this video, as is the case with every video. Now let's get back to business and talk about the offense. Speaking of what I said right before our break, the offense has been the inferior side of the ball under Fleck for, I would say, the past four years. Yeah, 20, 21 22, 23. 20 was weird, though, and I don't remember much from 2020. I don't remember watching much of Minnesota football from 2020. Both sides of the ball that year were bad, from my understanding. But in 2021 and 2022, Minnesota fielded admirable defenses, defenses that were top 10 in scoring, that were, I think, top 10 in pass defense, or even top 5 in pass defense, if my memory serves me correctly. Minnesota in 21, I remember for sure, was top 10 in defensive efficiency per ESPN's FPI. The offense just, ever since that 2019 season where there was Rashad Bateman, where there was Tyler Johnson, where Tanner Morgan had an awesome year that was his best year of his collegiate career, and Kirk Sharaka and that unit were just It was a well-oiled machine. That's the best I could describe that offense. The way they picked apart Penn State, especially in the first half, in that, un, I think it was an yeah, undefeated matchup. That was incredible that year. Minnesota's offense has not seen anything close to that level of success, except for maybe early parts of the 2022 season, but then Tanner Morgan got banged up. Minnesota faced an elite defense in Illinois, and other tough teams that they just couldn't overcome with some of their injuries. And also, Kirk Scirocco wasn't as successful his second time around at Minnesota. He's now at Rutgers now, which is part of the reason why Kaliak Mann is transferred there. And now, it will be Matt Simon and Greg Harbaugh Jr. 
who will be taking over the offense. Those are the new coordinators now, and they were the coordinators last season as well. I just say new. Of course, you know what I'm talking about. New in the sense that they succeeded Kirk Shiraka after he left. Max Brosmer is still transitioning from the FCS to the FBS. He threw one touchdown and a pick in the scrimmage yesterday. Daniel Jackson and Darius Taylor were rested. They didn't play. And that might sound like a bad thing, but that's pretty normal in spring games for young players to play and for more experienced players, especially ones who are dealing with injuries, to rest or take very limited snaps. So there's nothing wrong with that. And at running back, we have a new emerging playmaker in, say, Ben-Gura or Banjura. I hope one of those pronunciations of the last name was correct. But he's had success at Ohio. He had a 1,000-yard season in 2022, where he also had 13 rushing touchdowns. And last year at Ohio, he had 811 rushing yards and seven rushing touchdowns. Last year for Ohio was definitely a step back from the 2022 season. Part of that was Curtis Roke just not being the same after his injury in their first game of the season against San Diego State which is, in that game, was the only time where I saw Brady Hoke ever wearing a headset in my life. But that's beside the point. A Bangura, I think, is a battering ram, six foot, 209 pounds. He's from Maryland, played in the MAC. That's an area where Fleck is familiar with, and with the MAC being in the Midwest, a lot of Big Ten schools are familiar with MAC territory. He transfers in, Marcus Major transfers in from Oklahoma, where last year he had 308 rushing yards and one rushing touchdown. You have depth now behind Darius Taylor. If you're Minnesota, if you're P.J. Fleck, if you're Matt Simon, if you're Greg Harbaugh Jr., you have depth in the running back room now. And experience. Darius Taylor nearly ran for 1,000 yards last year. He had 799 yards and five rushing touchdowns in only six games played. And in one of those games against Nebraska, he only had one carry. It was the the week after that Nebraska game where Minnesota barely won that they thought to themselves, we need to run the football better. So Darius Taylor overtook Sean Tyler, and he started it against Eastern Michigan, or at least he took over that game. He started against North Carolina, Northwestern, where he got injured, started again against Iowa, in which Minnesota won in a controversial way, and he got injured after that. And then he had 35 carries and 208 rushing yards, both career highs against Bowling Green in the Quick Lane Bowl. He needs to get healthy. He is going to be an absolute beast this coming season behind an offensive line that I think is going to improve with most of their starters returning and most of the wide receivers, the key wide receivers that I care about, which is basically Daniel Jackson, they return. And Taylor coming back at running back, the majority of the production came from him last year. That's huge. So I think the offense should improve. It's encouraging to see a young player, a new player in Bangura step up. Fleck also mentioned some other players that stood out to him. Pierce Walsh at tight end, who's young, and he's a freshman. And Daniel Hayes, whose nickname is Nuke. I think he's a, a sophomore at receiver. He's reportedly made some plays. So those are some names to watch on the offensive side of the football. Now overall, just touching on some final thoughts and in light of what I've read and heard from Minnesota's spring practices so far and yesterday's spring scrimmage on April 11th. I only mention that in case someone is watching this video in the future and they're confused as to what yesterday means, which is understandable. Minnesota returns 71% of their production. They added seven transfer players who were all either corners, wide receivers, running backs, or the quarterback and Max Brosmer. Brosmer's growth is good news. That's encouraging to hear. That's something that you want to hear. I have not exactly been high on Brosmer so far, just because transferring from the FCS to the FBS, it's not the toughest thing in the world. P.J. Fleck even touched on that, how he thinks a lot of it is mostly just small adjustments like um, gaps, closing quicker, you need to have better release, 
and you have a better supporting cast, and you're also facing bigger and tougher defenses, etc. He says that a jump from high school to the collegiate level is much bigger, and I agree with that. But still, there there is some risk there, especially when you go from the FCS to a, a weird conference. The Big Ten's a weird conference. Uh, I like parts of it. I don't like other parts of it. I, I wish that the conference as a whole would be more like Ohio State in 21 and 22, or even Michigan State in 21, where you had exciting, weird offenses with star players to, to complement the elite defenses that the Big Ten has produced and probably will always produce. It's good news to see that he is growing, though. I think that Minnesota has a good set of receivers, good stable of running backs, and the offensive line returning both of their tackles, their guards. I think that they're going to improve compared to last year, which certainly wasn't as good of a year with John Michael Schmitz leaving. And he was a great center, elite center in 22. And the 21 and 22 Minnesota offensive lines were just different. Those offensive lines and Tanner Morgan and Muhammad Ibrahim departing the program after 2022, uh, 2023 in hindsight should have been expected to be a down year. That's something I didn't follow, and I sadly disobeyed conventional wisdom, which you sometimes have to in college football, especially with the portal and many other things, NIL, recruiting. There's not an easy, simple conventional wisdom, but sometimes you just have to follow the numbers, and Minnesota followed the numbers last year. They were one of the lowest teams in returning production, and therefore they took steps back especially for a team that doesn't use the portal a ton or doesn't recruit at an insanely high level and doesn't have tons of resources, it's probably wise to follow conventional wisdom for a team such as that, and Minnesota fits that bill. The defense, they return experience too, in fact, more experience than the offense, and they have added depth at corner, which I think the secondary overall was Minnesota's weakest position last year. The defense should take steps forward, and not only is the defensive back room interesting, the front seven is aging, like I mentioned earlier, and I do think that they could break out. All of this put together, I'm more optimistic about Minnesota than what we saw last season. Like taking last season into account, five and seven, having a high APR, academic progress rate, so Minnesota can go to a bowl game with a five and seven record, they go six and seven. I'm optimistic about Minnesota's chances on improving their win total. Their win total right now is at four and a half, but their schedule is tough. It is not an easy schedule, and I think what Minnesota has to do is start off with a win. They host North Carolina on August 29th, which is a Thursday. They absolutely need that win, in my opinion. Because after North Carolina, they get Rhode Island at home, they get Nevada at home, and then Iowa, that, that's conference opener, rivalry game, Iowa, who's going to have revenge on their mind, they have a better offensive coordinator, and they return a similar amount of production to what Minnesota returns. And then road trip to Michigan on the 28th, hosting USC on the 5th, road trip at UCLA on the 12th, then you have your bye October 19th, the rest of the schedule is Maryland at Illinois at Rutgers, by Penn State at Wisconsin. It's a tough schedule. There is no Ohio State. There is no Oregon. Those are the two favorites for the conference right now, according to Vegas. But Penn State at home, Wisconsin on the road to end the season. That's a tough two-game stretch. The October, early November stretch isn't too bad. I mean, USC, even in October, it will be an adjustment for them to travel this way. But Opening with Iowa in conference play, then at Michigan, and then USC at home, that's a tough conference opener. And North Carolina, they lose Drake May, they lose parts of their offensive line, they lose Devontae Walker, but they return Amari and Hampton and parts of their defense. So that's a, a team that will be decent, and I think that Minnesota should beat them, and they have to beat them in order to have a successful upcoming season. Thank you all so much for watching. Remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and comment your thoughts on Minnesota football down in the comment section below. Thank you to Crash2488 for sponsoring this video and channel as a Heisman member. 
Thanks to Spencer Bringhurst, Chris Lane, and SFS Inverter for being all American members and sponsoring this video and channel. And thanks to Will Loftus, John Lynn, Roaming Gnome, Matthew Sale, Austin Christmas, and Janisha Cockrell for being all conference members and sponsoring this video and channel. Have a great day, guys, and I will see you all very soon. Bye-bye.